is Science Max. Experiments at large. Science Max! Greetings, Science Maximites, and welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. My name is Phil, and today on Science Max Experiments at Large, we're going to be looking at vibration. Vibration is when things go back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. <laughs> All kinds of things vibrate, like pendulums. Pendulums. Wait, wait, and pendulum. Pendulums are designed to swing back and forth. Stop that. Also, metronomes. Me oh. <laughs> metronomes are used by people when they're when they're practicing music to keep accurate time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Putting it back. And, okay, we're gonna be building, whoa, okay, we're gonna be building this little guy. This is a vibrobot, and he vibrates, and he skitters around on the paper. And if we take the caps off the markers, he makes interesting patterns on the paper. Okay, so. Let's get started. Let's build a vibrobot. Oh yeah, you know what? Maybe it's time to take off the ski boots, huh? Oh. There we go, that's better. So today, like I said, we're gonna be making a vibrobot. And here are all the materials you need to make your own. Plastic cup, three markers, an electric motor, just make sure you ask an adult first, a battery, a plastic drink bottle cap, a toothpick, scissors, this kind of tape is called electrical tape, science tape, which is the same as invisible tape, but of course I use this tape only for science, and some modeling clay, and these are two bendy straws that I've taped googly eyes to. These are not necessary, I just like them for decoration. Now remember, if I'm going too fast here, which I probably will be, you can get all of the steps on how to make your very own Vibrobot on our website. Okay, so here's how you get started. First, you're gonna make the feet for your Vibrobot. So I attach some science tape to the markers, and then I put the marker on the bottom of the cup. And then I do that again to the next marker, and then the third, balance it like that. There. Next thing you wanna do is take your plastic drink bottle cap and make a hole with a toothpick. You want to make it off to the side, right about there, just like that. That's so when it turns, it will be off center. That's what's going to give us our vibration. So once you've made that hole, take some modeling clay and stick it in the cap to give it some weight. When you've done that, stick it onto the shaft of your motor like this. See how it's off center there? Now we just need to attach it to the vibrobot. I just put it right here on the top, and I like to attach the battery to the back of the cup. And now, finally, we're going to attach the eyes. We take some science tape, and we put the straws over here. I am Vibrobot. I am here to vibrate. Take me to your leader. So then, you attach your tape with the wire to the top of the battery there, and then the other wire to the bottom of the battery. Just like that, and let your Vibrobot make some art. <laughs> now, if the battery is new, your Vibrobot might be jumping up and down quite a bit. So you can do what I like to do and add some more weight, and then you make better lines with your Vibrobot. And your Vibrobot makes art. How long will he last? Probably till lunch. And there you go. Vibrobot art, art made by a robot. How cool is that? So that's what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna meet Chris from Logics Academy and he's gonna help me max out the Vibrobot. Plus, we're gonna learn a little bit more about vibration. Come on. Oh, hey, Chris. Oh, uh, oh hey, Phil. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. Okay, here's your Science Max lab coat. Thank you. So you guys at Logics Academy, you also build a Vibrobot, right? That's right, we do. This is mine, and it works pretty well. That's awesome. So, I want to max this out. Cool. So I thought we would start with, instead of this motor, we would start with this motor. Wow. It used to be a round circle, but I cut it off so that it's off-center. Perfect. I've also got 
This is our battery. Fantastic. That's as far as I've gotten so far. Well, it looks like we need a frame next. Right, something to be the cup. That's right. So we just need some sort of larger cup. Ooh, how about that metal shelf over there? Oh, uh, this thing? Yeah. This is just something I keep my parts on. It's perfect. Really? Yep, the shelves will house everything that we need, and it looks like it'll be strong enough to hold everything together. Now, the Vibrobot had markers on the bottom of it. That's right. To make a little pattern. Should we try that with this? Because we're going bigger, what if we use paint and paintbrushes instead? OK, sure. We could attach paintbrushes to the legs. Pass me one. All right, so now all we need to do is get some paint and some paper. That's right. And uh, we can fire it up. Great OK, let's, let's move it over this way. Vibration and frequency. What's the difference? They're all connected. Ta-da! Now, we get, whoa. Wow. Vibration is things going back and forth. Back and forth. And back and forth. It's a cycle. Cycle, 25 bucks. Oh, yeah, it's the wrong kind of cycle. Never mind. Well, if that's vibration, then what's frequency? Well, frequency is a measure of how fast or slow, how frequent those vibrations happen. Look at this bowling ball. It is swinging back and forth, but not very fast. You could say it has a low frequency. We measure all kinds of things by the frequency. This thing is terrifying. When you turn the dial on your radio, you're tuning in to different frequencies of radio waves. Hey, look at this punching balloon. It's going very fast. You could say it has a high frequency. <laughs> so, now you know. Vibration is something going back and forth, and frequency is how quickly it does it. Yeah. Ramona, the bowling ball keeps coming through everything. How do you turn it off? OK, back to our main experiment. Chris and I are taking a Vibrobot and maxing it out. We have a large motor and a battery, and we're taping it all to some shelving. Just like our small Vibrobot, our motor needs something to make it unbalanced when it spins. That's what will cause the vibrations. It's just taped. I haven't attached it in any other way. Do you think that's OK? As an engineer, I have superior faith in duct tape. OK, well, that, that's good to know. We're also adding an on-off switch and some paintbrushes on the bottoms of the legs so our maxed-out Vibrobot can make art just like the small one. The final step, dipping the brushes in paint and setting it on a big piece of paper. We fire it up, and it immediately shakes everything off the shelves. Oh! It, it totally spilled all the stuff on the shelves. The motor shakes the Vibrobot a lot, but there's a problem. All that shaking is starting to take its toll on the shelves. The wheels come off, the screws come out, and finally... It totally it shook itself apart. Destroyed itself. The shelving unit just completely falls apart when it's being shaken. Vibration is really hard on the structure of an object. We need something more sturdy, something that can, that can take weight. Steps, maybe? Yeah. OK, hold on. OK. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this looks much better. Okay, great. So we build the new Vibrobot out of this. So more paint brushes, bigger motor, more paint, more everything. More everything. All right, good. This is a pendulum. It's just a weight suspended on a line and anchored from above. Pretty simple. Pendulums were used for hundreds of years for all kinds of reasons, but most famously in clocks. Why were pendulums used in clocks? Well, here's why. Let's mark every time the pendulum hits the bottom of the swing right here. OK, watch. All right, now here's the question. How fast will the beeps be if I swing it from much higher up? Let's find out. No matter how high the pendulum swings, it keeps the same frequency. That's why they were used in clocks, because it could swing for a long while, and even though it would lose energy, it would still keep perfect time. The frequency of a pendulum doesn't change, no matter how high it swings or how much weight is on the bottom. The frequency comes from how long the line is. 
Now this is a pendulum wave. Because each bowling ball has a line that's a different length, they have a slightly different frequency. They start out swinging together, but soon they start to make interesting patterns. Remember, each pendulum is keeping its own perfect time, even if it's slowing down. It's only the length of the line that gives each pendulum a different frequency. And now, we're gonna max it out with, with, um, well, I guess these are already bowling balls, so this is already pretty maxed out. I'm just gonna, just gonna leave that there. These are balloons. This is a laser, and these are awesome laser safety glasses. Now, lasers are made of light, and light has a frequency. In fact, each color of light has a different frequency. This is a red laser. Check it out. Yeah, cool. This is also a very powerful laser. Oh, I can pop the blue balloon with the red laser because the blue absorbed the red light from the laser and then it heated up and the balloon popped. But here's the cool thing. I cannot pop a red balloon with a red laser because the red balloon reflects the red light from the red laser and I can't pop it. If I wanted to pop a balloon with a red laser, I need to use a darker balloon, one that absorbs the red light, like <laughs> like a black balloon, haha. <laughs> so there you go. Lasers, frequencies of light. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep this red balloon because it's always nice to have a balloon. <laughs> Chris and I are maxing out the Vibrobot, but our last version shook itself apart. Now the plan is to start with something more solid and try again. We found some very solid steps and added an even bigger motor, an even bigger battery, and attached a half circle wheel to make the vibrations when the motor spins. We add some paint brushes and fire it up. Here we go. Come on. Go, Vibrobot. Hmm. It wants to move. Is it moving at all? Hmm. Hmm. So it's still not working. It's already getting caught in the paper and it's on the paintbrushes. And the, yeah, the paintbrushes seem to be absorbing too much vibration and then the paper's stopping it as well. So why don't we remove the paintbrushes? Yeah. And we might as well remove the paper if we don't have any more paintbrushes. Yes. And we'll see what happens. Let's see what happens. Okay. No paintbrushes, no paper. Okay. Now let's try it. Three, two, one, go! Yeah! Aha! It's moving. Not bad. The shaking is good, but I don't know if the shaking is enough. So what do we do? Well, we could add another battery. Another battery which would give it more power? That's right. Okay, let's try that. Okay. Okay, so it wasn't working before. No. Not enough power. And now we've got a second battery here. That's right, we've wired them up so that one power feeds into the other, so we've got twice as much juice as we do. So it's just a matter of clipping this onto there. That's right, but hold on. Yeah, safety glasses, because now we don't know what's going to happen <laughs> anymore. Ready? Three, two, one. The extra battery makes a big difference. The new Vibrobot shakes around and only shakes itself apart a little. All right, Whoa. that was amazing. <laughs> okay, so all we needed was more power. That's right, I think it didn't have enough power to, to vibrate up and down and that's why it wasn't moving every time it hit the ground. So I think if we're gonna use this much power, I think we need to build it again. Okay. Build it even stronger and with a bigger motor. Yeah. And more power. And then maybe I ride it. <laughs> You think we can build that? Of course. Of course. Okay, let's do it. You want to see something cool? I can make this water levitate, defy gravity using the power of science. You want to see? Behold! <laughs> gravity defying water. I can even make the water go very slowly. Or I can make the water go back up into the hose. Or I can make the water completely stop. <laughs> you know what's interesting? The water does not seem to be stopped for me. 
you see stopped water because you are looking at it through a TV camera. See? Real life TV camera. Real life TV camera. You see, movie cameras and TV cameras take a whole bunch of still photos and then run them together really, really fast. 24 times a second for our TV cameras. I have created a device that drops water at 24 times a second. And what happens is everything lines up. So it looks like the water drops aren't moving. But watch this. I grab the hose and it's fine. But I let it go and the hose is vibrating back and forth at exactly the same time the camera shutter is going back and forth and everything looks like it stopped. The power of frequency has defied gravity. Okay, so not really. It's kind of a camera trick, but I prefer to call it science. Here's a fun way to play with things going back and forth. This is Euler's disc, and it's designed to spin like this. What's going on is friction and gravity are slowing that down and pulling it towards the Earth. Now, you don't need a fancy disc like this to do this at home. All you need is a pot lid. Check it out. When the pot lid spins, friction and gravity start to slow it down, which means each spin gets lower and lower and the frequency gets higher and higher. But the difference between a pot lid and Euler's disc is Euler's disc is made to go for as long as possible. The heavy puck has a slightly rounded edge and sits on a glass surface that is slightly concave, like a bowl. All of this is designed to make Euler's disc last a really long time, which is, which is quite a while. But eventually, friction and gravity pull the disc down, and finally, it stops. Pretty amazing, right? Well, wait till we max it out. This is Trevor, head of the Science Max build team. Hey. Thanks for setting this up, Trevor. So what is this? This is a giant side of a spool, big hydro spool. OK, so this is the largest disk that we could totally find. And we've got it all hooked up here. We lift it up, we spin it, and then you pull the thing, and it will drop down and, and spin like a coin, because it's the only way we can do that with something this heavy. Yeah. Ready? I'm ready. OK. Trevor and I hoist it up and get it suspended above the ground. Yeah. Then I start to wind it up. Ready? When it's going fast enough, and go, Trevor! Trevor pulls the release and... It turns out a 200 kilogram spinning disc works exactly the same. As it spins and rolls, gravity and friction work on it, and the frequency speeds up as it gets closer to the ground until it stops. Giant Euler's disc. Nicely done, Trevor. That was awesome. That was great. Let's do it again. All right. Our Vibrobot was working well, so that means it's time to make it way bigger. We started with a big metal table and added a huge motor, one 20 times as powerful as the last one. Instead of batteries giving us 12 volts of power, we're going to use a plug, which is 10 times more power. We've added an off-center wheel for vibration, bolted the motor to the frame, and added a protective cage all around to prevent anything from flying off. It even has a seat for me to ride. OK. OK. You ready? Ready. Here we go. We fire it up, and it's very shaky. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. That was really uncomfortable. <laughs> oh. It was like very bangy, even with the, even with the seat. Yeah. Huh? I'm going to try standing on All it. All right. When I try standing on it, the Vibrobot lives up to its name. It vibrates all around the lab. Oh, wow. My legs are numb to, to the knee. I'm not surprised. <laughs> Vibrobot! All right. Yeah, that worked really well. That was awesome. I can't, I really can't feel my feet right now. And it held together, which is impressive. That's right, the more power and the stronger structure paid off. Yeah, I, the only thing I regret is not getting a chance to, wait a minute, wait a minute, come with me. 
Okay, so I achieved my dream of riding the Vibrobot. You did. But we never got a chance to make art, so we've dipped a whole bunch of nuts and bolts and heavy things in paint. Yeah. And now we're gonna turn on the Vibrobot and see if we can make some art. <laughs> Let's see how it looks. Oh, wow. Ta-da! Vibrobot art. Vibrobot has been a huge success and we got some art to keep. High fives. Well done. Science Max, experiments at large. Who gets to keep the art? Uh, rock, paper, scissors. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, tie. One, two, three. Tie. One, two, three. One, two, three. Wow. One, two, three. Ah, oh, tie. One, two, three. Man. Greetings, Science Maximites. I am Phil McCordick, and this is Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're going to be experimenting with the balloon-powered car. Here's how it works. Woohoo! It all has to do with Newton's third law. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, we don't we don't have to do this now. We can this is all for later. We can build the cars first and then we can uh let's go over here. So how do you build a balloon-powered car? Well, I suggest you be science maximites because there's any number of ways you can build a balloon-powered car. You do not have to follow my design. You should come up with one of your own. It may even be better than the one I built. But I will give you some tips, though, that make it a lot easier. First of all, you need something to stick your balloon on that has an opening on it. I used a turkey baster for this car. I just pop the top off and remember to tell an adult that you're using the turkey baster. And then you stick the balloon on there and it allows you to attach something to the car and it also makes it easier to blow up the balloon. <laughs> you can use any number of things, even just uh, any kind of tube that you find lying around. It helps you attach the balloon to the car and it helps you blow up the balloon way easier. The other thing you should think about when you make your balloon powered car is how you're going to make the wheels roll. Once you've decided on the base of the car, you could use anything, even just a piece of cardboard like this, you can do your wheels in two ways. The first way is to attach the wheels to the axle. This is how I made the axle of this car. I used a shish kebab skewer and I stuck it inside a straw, just like that. And then I attached the lids to the shish kebab skewer. So the lids and the shish kebab skewer are attached and they rotate in the straw. That's one way to make the wheels turn. The other way is to tape down the axle or whatever you're going to use uh, and have the wheels spin around on the axle. Two great ways to make your wheels turn and it really kind of depends on the wheels you're using. You can make your own design and keep refining it and making it better and faster or do what I like to do and make a whole bunch of different cars. So we've got this one. Uh, this one I made out of paper plates, and this is a snorkel. Awesome. This one is the rock car, because there's a rock on it. I've got uh, the dragster model. It's a long broom handle, and it might not work that well, but who, who knows? And this is my favorite design. It's made out of waffles and an ice cube tray. This is why I make a whole bunch of different cars, because I can race them. Sunday, 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 at the Science Maxidrome. It's the balloon powered car winner take all drag race of awesome. First up, the Eliminator. <laughs> Woohoo! Better late than never, it's the Procrastinator. <laughs> Crushing the competition, it's the Terminator! <laughs> Feel the chill of the refrigerator! <laughs> And last but not least, the um, regurgitator.
<sighs> well, when you build your balloon-powered cars, you can figure out what worked or uh, what didn't work and try modifying your designs to make them work even better. That is science. And now we're gonna max it out because this is Science Max Experiments at Large. So we're gonna take that small balloon-powered car that we just built and we're gonna make it much, much bigger. I'm gonna go to the Center for Skills Development and Training and we're gonna use the science behind the small balloon-powered car and we're gonna make it big. That science is Newton's third law. But there's Newton's plenty of- third law. No, there's, for every action, there's, there's there plenty of time for this later. We're not doing, action. we're not doing this bit now. We're doing that bit in a minute. So we could, wait, wait, no, I, I said we're doing it later. We're doing it later. <sighs> Whoa. Uh, hi, Sarah. Hi, Phil. This is Sarah, and she's got a master's degree in physics from McMaster University. Right. And we're gonna be talking about Newton's third law. Ooh, look out, look out, duck. Uh, sorry, sorry. There was a sign that kept coming in. Um, Never mind. Newton's third law. Well, what is that? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Right. So how does that work with our balloon car? Ah, cool. Okay, so if you blow up the balloon, what's going to happen when you release it is the air is going to push out with a certain force, which in turn is going to cause the cart to move forward with the exact same force. Yeah, works great. So how come it doesn't work with my rock cart? Ah, wow. Well, actually, it did work. So the balloon still pushes with the exact same force, which causes the cart to have the exact same force push forward, but your rock is really heavy, so you probably didn't see it move. Oh, so a lighter cart works better with the same amount of force. That's it. Well, there you go. Newton's third law. What? Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. I'm really starting to dislike that sign. Phil, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Our small balloon-powered car works because of Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The air pushing out the balloon this way pushes the car with the same amount of force this way. So, in order to max it out, the plan is just to get a bigger wheeled cart and a much bigger balloon. So, everything should work out the same. Okay, so, sir, oh, oh, oh. I thought what we would do is I would, in order to max out the balloon-powered car. What we need is a cart to start with, and then I ride it. And we have a giant balloon, and then I go. Do you have a giant balloon? Ha, 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 Giant balloon! So, step one, uh, Sarah blows up the balloon. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Use this air compressor, it'll probably be a lot faster. Sarah and I get to work blowing up the balloon, and it takes a long time. A very long time. Okay, human-sized balloon-powered car test. Take one. All right, Sarah. You got it? Yeah. Okay, let it go. Okay, go, go. Let it go. <laughs> I and did. You did let it go. I just let go. Nothing is happening. It's not coming out fast enough, and you're a bit too massive. I don't think it's gonna work like this. Really? Yeah. Okay, uh, balloon powered car test two. No fill. I'll just take it. And... Ah! What happened? Uh, I don't think it worked. The balloon popped. Phil, are you okay? This is why you wear protective eyewear. Uh, yeah. So, that didn't work? No. No. Should we get another balloon? Uh... I think uh, we need something else. Okay, well, the air coming out of the balloon just what, didn't have enough force, so. We need the air to come out with more force. Yeah, do we get, what, a bigger a bigger balloon? I don't think that's gonna work. I don't think it's that. I think we need something with compressed air. Oh, like a scuba tank or a... Fire extinguisher, something like that. Yeah, that, that's what we need. Okay, sure. Well, we can, all right, so I don't know if that's safe to do that, so we'd have to build, a, like, a cage or yeah, something. Yeah, I don't know if it's gonna work on this. All right, well, back... Back to the drawing board. So okay. what we should do is we should get a- We need a, to find these tanks. You get the tanks and then we make a, like a frame out of aluminum or something. Okay, that can work. Yeah, That's they can hold idea. the tanks so yeah. they're safe. And then what we should do is- Who was Isaac Newton? He was a mathematician and probably number one on the list of top scientists of all time. 
Albert Einstein said, Isaac Newton was the smartest person that ever lived. You've got to be special if Einstein is calling you smart. Newton's three laws of motion was a huge idea, but did you know Newton also came up with the idea of gravity? The famous story is that in 1666, Isaac Newton was sitting under an apple tree when he watched an apple fall and wondered why. Hey everyone, I just invented gravity, which was a big relief because up until then, everyone was just floating around. Okay, so it didn't happen like that. He didn't invent gravity, he gave a name to this invisible force and then described how it works. Not only did it make things fall down, but it was the same force that kept the moon circling the Earth and the Earth circling the sun. And he invented a new kind of math to explain how. We now call it calculus. See, I told you he was smart. He's very smart. This is hydrophobic coating. Hydrophobic literally means afraid of water, but it's not actually afraid of water. The chemistry of a hydrophobic coating prevents water molecules from penetrating anything you spray it on. You can get this stuff at the hardware store, and if you want, be science maximites and get an adult and think of the coolest thing you could spray with hydrophobic coating. I like to use things that do not go well when you put them in water, like uh, tissue. Yeah, doesn't look great when it gets wet. Here's a tissue coated in hydrophobic coating. Huh? Weird. Or it works the same with a paper towel. Paper towel in water, paper towel covered in hydrophobic coating, stays dry. Or how about a dinner roll? Dinner rolls really don't like water. See? Gross. But a dinner roll coated in hydrophobic coating? Weird. Just don't eat it. Now, it's time to max it out. I have coated half of my lab coat in hydrophobic coating, and the other half, I have not. Hydrophobic coating, regular lab coat. Half of me is wet, and half of me is dry. What's more, half of my outfit ended up being wet and half dry because the lab coat was protecting my outfit from getting wet. Now it's time to max it out even more. We have coated my entire outfit in hydrophobic spray. My shirt, my pants, and my lab coat. The pants have been taped to rubber boots, so no water's getting in there. And my shirt has been taped to my pants, so no water's getting in there. So here's the question. Can I get into the pool and out of the pool and stay dry? Let's find out. In the pool, out of the pool, and I'm still mostly dry. Now here's what really happened. I got into the pool, and I realized I should have duct taped the pocket, because all the water went in there, down into the rubber boots, started filling up the rubber boots, and now my entire leg is full of water because the hydrophobic coating isn't letting it come out. So the hydrophobic coating isn't keeping the water out, now it's keeping the water in. Let's take a closer look at Newton's third law. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. OK. All right, let's watch it back. When the sign hits me, I exert a force on the sign in the opposite direction. That makes the sign stop moving. It also exerts an equal force on me, causing me to fly off in this direction. Now, if I was to push this sign, I'm not only pushing the sign this way, but my feet are pushing against the ground in the opposite direction. It's, um, well, it's really easier to see if I'm not standing on the ground. Um, oh, hold on. Okay, so, huh? Oh, okay. So now that I'm hanging, watch. I push on the sign, but when I exert force on the sign to make it go this way, I go that way. Well, actually, it's, it doesn't work as well because the sign isn't as heavy as I am. So wait, I have this over here. This is a, a barrel, and it has stuff in it, and it weighs as much as I do. OK, so watch. If I push on the barrel like that, I go away from it as much as it goes away from me. So. There you have it. Newton's. Newton's third. No, hold on. Newton's. Newton's third law. Newton's third law. Okay, go. 
Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So, using a giant balloon to push me on a cart, uh, didn't work. And I... Ah! What happened? <laughs> the plan now is to use the compressed gas cylinder. Just like a balloon, these cylinders contain a lot of air. If we get a cart and put a gas cylinder in a cage, for safety, on the back and open the valve, the escaping air might have enough force to push me. This is two cubic meters of air. If we were to put it in a balloon, the balloon would be this big. But if we compress the air, we can fit it all into one of these, a steel tank. This is what we're gonna be using next for our air-powered car. Got it? Yep. All right. Good. So Sarah and I have been hard at work and we've built the air-powered cart. We can't call it a balloon-powered cart anymore because now we've got a compressed air tank, so it's not a balloon that powers it. Exactly. Okay, so I'm gonna sit on here, Sarah's gonna turn on the tank, and I'm gonna go. And before we do this, we should say, do not, under any circumstances, try this at home. We are trained professionals. You ready? I'm ready. Okay, high five first. Okay, now we do it. Okay, so before I turn the tank on, make sure your feet are down and the brakes are on. Gotcha. Uh, Don't take them off till I say go. You have got it. All right. Ready. Okay. Yeah, it did work, but I feel I feel like it could work better. You want to go faster? I do want to go faster. This reminds me of the rock car. Yeah. Well, we didn't have a big enough balloon. We need more force. We need more force. So should we get a bigger tank? Let's get more tanks. More, more tanks, more force. You're gonna go faster forward. Newton's third law. Newton's third law. High five. All right, let's do it. All right. Newton's Cradle, and it's a really cool toy that demonstrates all kinds of laws of motion, including Newton's third law. Newton's third what you do ball. is you pull this one ball out, and when it hits these reaction. balls, they exert force on that ball to make it stop moving, but it exerts force on these balls, which travels through the balls and makes this one on the end fly out, like that. Now, there's a lot going on here, but you can really see how the force is equal that you put in and you get out if you use two balls. I swing two balls up, and two balls go out that side. Isn't that cool? Now, it wouldn't be science max unless we maxed it out, so come on. Whoa! OK. This is one we built out of bowling balls. Bowling balls. Bowling balls. <laughs> Instead of smaller balls. And I think it's going to work the same way. Let's find out. You throw one out, and, and <laughs> yeah, it works the same. OK, now let's try it with two balls. OK, ready? Wait, 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 wait. And two balls, throw them out. And two balls on that side. All right, so there you have it. Whoa. Newton's third law. Oh. Ah. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So our single pressurized tank created enough force to move me, but not very fast. The plan now is to do two things. First, we're going to triple the amount of thrust by using three tanks. We're also going to use some pipes that lock into each other to give me an initial push. These pipes slide together, and when the air is turned on, the pressure in the pipes will cause them to slide apart, which will push me forward. After that, I use what's left in the tanks to keep going. All right, now it's time to max it out. I've enlisted the help of a few more Science Max people. Thank you very much, Corey. You'll see now we have three tanks of compressed gas, and we've also got this nifty little contraption. How does this work, Sarah? All right, so each tank is attached back, to a tube, yeah. and you can see that each tube goes into this one main tube, so when we turn them on, pressure's gonna build up, and we're gonna go forward with more force. Well, that's great, and Reed is stacking cinder blocks. Thanks, Reed, uh, up so that will push uh, the pipe will push against the cinder blocks, and then I'll go that forward. way. All right, well, are you guys ready? I'm ready. All right, let's do it. 
Now, again, I have to say, thank you, Corey. I've got it. This is something you definitely don't want to try at home. We are all trained professionals. We have a physics degree here. We've got TV people that make sure that this is safe. So uh, watch it and enjoy, but please don't try any of this at home. Okay, I'm ready. Sarah, count me down. Three, two, one. Uh oh! Uh oh! <laughs> 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 that was awesome! That was really awesome! All right, high fives! High fives! Yeah, 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 yeah! <laughs> and it's raining now, so it looks like we're gonna have to stop. So thank you very much for joining us on Science Mac Experiments at Large in our episode on Newton's Third Law. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. At this very moment, Half the lab is being held together with the power of electromagnets. And magnet one turning off. <laughs> electromagnets are a really cool and powerful way to interact with the world. And when I say power, that's because you need power to make them work or not work. <laughs> Magnetism is an invisible force that has to do with the magnetic fields created by magnets that lets them attract things that are metal or each other. But electromagnetism is a little different. You see, magnets are magnets all the time. It's because of what they're made out of. Electromagnets are only a magnet when you have an electric current going through them, which means you can turn them on or off. Today, we're gonna be building an electromagnet. Oh, that was, that was the wrong switch. Anyway, like I was saying, today we're gonna be building an electromagnet. You need a bunch of copper wire, a very large nail, or something metal to become your electromagnet, electrical tape, a battery, an on-off switch, wire strippers or a craft knife, and the help of an adult, and finally, something to magnetize, like these paper clips. And remember, all of the steps for this experiment are on the website. To begin, take the copper wire and start at the top of the nail. Leave a little bit of wire sticking out, then carefully start to wrap the wire around the nail. Don't go all the way to the end because you need some metal to turn into the magnet. Instead, when you want to start again, run the wire straight back to the top and start wrapping again in the same direction. And keep wrapping and wrapping until you get to this. Now I've used some electrical tape here, here, and here to hold it all together. Using your wire strippers or a craft knife and the help of an adult, remove the plastic coating from the ends of the wires. Attach these wires to the wires from the on-off switch with electrical tape, or attach them directly to a battery if you don't have an on-off switch. And ta-da, you have an electromagnet with your on-off switch. All you need to do is take the things you're going to magnetize, turn your electromagnet on, and suddenly it becomes a magnet. Pretty amazing. <laughs> and then you can magnetize to your heart's content. But when you're done, don't forget you want to turn it off. So that's what we're gonna do today on Science Max, experiments at large. We're gonna max out the electromagnet. So, where's my lab coat? Oh, there it is. We're gonna see how big we can make an electromagnet. And when I say we, I mean me and an expert. Let's see, oh, Heather from the Ontario Science Center. She knows her way around magnets, so let's see. Uh, yeah, I wonder if she's busy. Well, let's find out. After we're done, I'll need to come back and clean up the giant mess I made in the lab. Hey! Hi, Heather, Hi. how are you doing? Good, good to see you, Phil. I was just wondering if you could help me with something. Are you busy? No, I got time, I got time. Okay, great, because I'm gonna make a giant electromagnet experiment and I need your help. That sounds like a lot of fun. Okay, great. great. Let's go back to Science Max headquarters. Oh, oh we'll via the portal? Yeah, by the portal. Oh, oh okay. You sure? 
Uh, yeah. I know you're hesitant, so I want to reassure you, nothing will go wrong. Great. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh. hey, we're here. We're yeah. outside. It's okay. It's no, okay. Don't, no, don't worry about it. No, 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 no. I think it's definitely. Fine. 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 You all right? Yeah, I was supposed to come in over there, but I came in over here. Uh, oh well. <laughs> so today, Heather, I want to max out the electromagnet. Turn it on, and it's a magnet. Pretty good. And turn it off, and it stops being a magnet. <laughs> I want to make this uh, into a much bigger maxed out version. All right. So what, what are some of the things we can do to do that? Well, actually, if you have a larger battery, one that has a higher voltage, we can try that for sure. Okay, that so will there, are, there are batteries that are 12 volts. Yes. We could try one of those. Give it a try, I think for those sure. are like bigger, right? Yeah, yeah, bigger, more powerful, absolutely. Now, that's one thing you could do. You mm -hmm. can also increase the number of wraps of our coil here. So, how many times we wrap that wire? Yes, we'll increase that magnetic field, making our magnet stronger. And of course, the nail, which is important because that's the thing that, that eventually becomes the magnet, right? Right on, yes. So, what I thought we would do is we would start with a bigger nail. Oh. What? Right? Yeah. So a uh, larger battery, yes. more voltage, and a lot more wraps of the wire. Right on. And we have more space for that now, which yeah. is smart. Good job. Great. OK. So uh, we'll get to work. Great. Max Historica. If you've ever seen a compass, you know that the needle points north. That's because a compass needle is a magnet, and it points towards the Earth's magnetic north pole. And I'm using this compass to try to get to the north pole. But it isn't easy. In fact, scientists knew there was such a thing as the north pole as far back as the 16th century. But no one was able to actually get there on foot until 1927. You'd think it wouldn't be that hard, right? I mean, the needle points you straight there. Just follow the needle, right? But now that I'm here, I realize it's really difficult. I mean, the wind is incredible, and the snow is intense, and, and it's so cold. My hands are, my hands, um, yeah. So OK, we were not really at the North Pole. We were just sort of recreating uh, that. Um, but still, I salute the brave explorers who tried to make it there in the name of science. And I got a sense of it because the the, the wind from the fan and the, and the fake the fake snow was it, um, okay everybody let's pack it up I mean that was that was that was pretty good I just didn't know about that other about that other camera so back to our main experiment where Heather and I are building a larger electromagnet an electromagnet works like this when an electric current is traveling through a wire it creates a magnetic field if you wrap that wire around something ferromagnetic, that's something made out of a metal that is attracted to magnets, like an iron nail, then it becomes a magnet. You can make a magnet stronger by wrapping more wire, which gives more distance for the current to travel, increasing the magnetic field, and you can also increase the strength of the current. Heather and I start with a coil of 30 meters of wire and start wrapping and wrapping, and wrapping. There, the wire is now all done. And remember, if you're doing this at home, do not use a drill unless you have an adult to help you out, because drills can be very dangerous. This one goes at a very slow speed, so it was OK. But yes, definitely an adult supervised activity. Then we attach another on-off switch and make some leads that connect to a 12-volt battery. So more wraps of wire and more current means the electromagnet should be stronger. OK. So we're going to try this electromagnet, and we're going to pick up this stuff right here. Great. Ready? You ready? Yeah. Three, Three two, two, one, go! Is it on? Yeah, yeah. Wow, it really does. You can't tell that it's on, but. No, but bring it closer and. Oh, yeah, look at that. OK, Not we turn fun. it off. All right. <laughs> Let's see if this nail can pick up this nail. All right. Ready? 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 Go. Uh, uh. Oh. OK, how about this side? Oh. No. Uh, no. Mm, I don't it's, think we're strong enough. It's not strong enough. I, I think that we need to max this out uh, even more. Even more? Right. Um, 
So I'm thinking there are a lot of appliances that use electromagnets, meaning it's already set up, it already has tightly wound coils and high voltage, so we're in a lab here. Maybe do you have old yeah. uh, appliances around? I have, I have parts bins with a whole bunch of stuff. Maybe oh. we could find some electromagnets in those. Let's do it. Okay, great, yeah. let's go. Pliers, battery, copper wire. Now, if you've already done the electromagnet experiment, here's another experiment that uses all the same materials, plus these. Ha! Neodymium magnets, some of the strongest magnets you can get. So, here's what you need. A battery, some neodymium magnets the same diameter as your battery, copper wire, and some pliers. So here's what you do. First thing is you put the batteries and the magnets together like that. Then what you want to do is bend the wire so it's touching the top of the battery and goes around the battery and then touches the magnets at the bottom. Here's what that might look like. I say might because you can do any shape you want. I've made a coil here. And if you put it over the battery, you'll see it only touches the very top of the battery and the magnets at the bottom. And if I let it go, it spins. It's a homopolar motor. What happens is the battery sends an electric current through the copper wire, and that turns it into an electromagnet, which is attracted to the magnets at the bottom, and it spins. So, now, let's max it out. Aha! A D-cell battery, which is larger, and, of course, larger neodymium magnets. And you do the same thing. Make a coil that only touches the battery at the top and at the magnet, and... Aha! It spins! Maxed out homopolar motor. But don't worry, this is not the biggest size we're gonna do. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Maxed out homopolar motor! I have 27 D cell batteries, a giant copper tube, and a neodymium magnet. So I'm just gonna, and then we get, get rid of that. Put this down. Okay, so the first thing I do is attach the neodymium magnet to uh, the batteries. And I've got all the batteries taped together here so they'll sort of stand up like, like this. Huh? <laughs> Giant stack of D cell batteries. Okay, now what I do is I take the copper coil. I take the copper coil. Um, I need to get, I need to get. Okay, hold on, hold on. I got this. I just need to get the copper coil there. <laughs> I did it. Okay, so I take the copper and I put it on top of the D-cell batteries like this, and then I let it go. <laughs> let it go. Nope, whoa. Homopolar motor. Okay, so that didn't work, but that's okay. I like it when it doesn't work, because that's science. It's not science if it works perfectly every time. I mean, you, you gotta have some room for improvement. Heather and I built a larger electromagnet, but it still wasn't as powerful as we hoped. So now we're searching for parts that came out of an appliance that are pre-built electromagnets. What about this? I think that'll do the trick. Do you think this is, a, this is, that does look like an electromagnet, huh? It does, yeah. And there's a whole big bunch of, of copper wires coiled, coiled on that. around. So you think we can use this? Yeah, let's try it. Okay, great. We built the next version of the electromagnet. This one already has the copper coils, so it's just a matter of attaching wires and an on-off switch, and attaching all of it to a 12-volt battery. Do you think 12 volts will be enough? Let's find out, I think so. Try that. Once we do, Ooh. it works much oh, better. Oh, no problem at all. Ready? Yep, turn it on. On. Whoa, Whoa. pretty good. <laughs> okay, off. off. Neat. In case it was really strong, I have the next step. Horseshoe! Okay, ready? Oh, whoa! That's... Fair. I can't pull that off. I... Okay, wait, we'll grab this. Okay? Work together. Yeah. <laughs> wow! So that's passed all of our tests. Yeah. This is really strong. Um, is what there a way we... to test it further? In order to test how strong our magnet is, it's as easy as seeing how much weight it'll lift. 
Heather and I find a metal table. All right, Phil, so I brought the electromagnet. Okay. Just put it right here. Yep. We add some sandbags for more weight and then attach a scale so we can measure how much weight we're lifting. We use a chain hoist, a simple machine made for lifting heavy things. This one can hold up to 454 kilograms. Want to turn it on? We're ready? Yep. Here we go. You can read on the scale how much weight is being lifted. And that scale is going up. Pounds on this side, kilograms on this side. We keep lifting until... Okay, so how much did it hold? It held 100 kilograms. Oh, that's more than I weigh, which gives me an idea. Come on. This is ferrofluid. It is ferromagnetic, which means it's attracted to magnets. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, it's not that interesting. Well, watch as I put it next to this magnet. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And because it's a liquid, it behaves in very interesting ways. Watch this. Unlike most things ferromagnetic, like paper clips or iron filings, ferrofluid is a liquid, which means it behaves in a unique way. The spikes it creates are following the magnetic field lines of the magnet. You can see the magnetic field in 3D. It's even more impressive when we max it out. This is ferrofluid outside of a glass jar. Now, it's sitting in a pool around this electromagnet. And this is a dial, which I can use to change the voltage of the electromagnet, making the magnet stronger. Watch this. Changing the current going to the spiral in the middle turns it into a magnet. The more current I put in, the stronger that magnet becomes, allowing the ferrofluid to climb the spiral to the top. And remember, even though it looks all spiky, it's still a liquid. I will demonstrate with my plastic spoon. And watch this. When I turn the magnet off, it stops being spiky. Turn it on. Turn it off. Science. Uh. The Wizard Academy. All you have to do is demonstrate true magic. And you will be granted entry. Well, Fuzzix, who is the next applicant for the Wizard Academy? Overwhelmo. Indeed it is I, Overwhelmo. And prepare to be over. Well, though, would you be flabbergastified if I balanced this coin on its end? Not really, no. But would you be impressed if I was to balance this coin on top of this coin? Possibly. Prepare to be flustered and stupefied. Stoopy. Stoopy flustered as I balance three coins on their ends on top of this glass. Well, that certainly would seem like magic. Let us see. OK. No pressure, Overwhelmo. You can do this. And now, I say, a magic word. A magic word! Ha 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 ha! And now, you must let me into your academy. Wait. What's under the cloth? What, what cloth? This cloth, nothing! Is that a magnet? This? No! The pull of the magnet is what's keeping those coins up. The magnet is just strong enough to keep the coins from falling. No, this is set, set dressing. It's just... <laughs> it was a good trick, but it's science, not magic. Well, yes. And you will see! You will see! I will be back! I, Overwhelmo, will return! And I will do such magic that you will need extra socks because I will knock them off! With my magic, you will need at least two pairs of socks, maybe three pairs of socks. We can still see you! No, you can't! So back to our main experiment. Heather and I have created a very strong electromagnet that can hold a lot of weight. 
It held 100 kilograms. Oh, which gave me an idea. All right, you ready? Let's do it. Electromagnets, super max out experiment. We've got... Two electromagnets, one, two. And those are wired to two batteries, which are on my belt, just like this, so that I can carry them around. And we've got a crash mat here because... We need to keep you safe because you're gonna be using these electromagnets to get across this massive beam above us. That's right, I'm gonna stick to this metal beam and go across with the electromagnets, wow. we, we hope. I, I have faith. I, I'm <laughs> glad you do. I've got a helmet for safety, goggles for safety, gloves for safety, but in this case, sometimes the lab coat is more safe and sometimes it's less safe. This time, it will get all caught up, so no, no lab coat. All right, you ready to go? I'm ready, let's do it. Okay. Oh my goodness. What? Okay. Because each of our electromagnets can hold more than my whole body weight, I can use them to cross the beam. When they're on, they stick like, well, magnets. And when I turn them off, they stop being magnets and I can move them along as I go. Now, this is something you should definitely not try at home. Come on, Phil. You're almost there. <laughs> we did it. No. You sure? I'm positive. Okay, <laughs> I'm going again. Woohoo! Crazy. <sighs> Greetings, Science Maximites. I'm Phil, and today on Science Max Experiments at Large, we're going to be looking at light. Uh, oh, 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 okay. Just stay. That, that wasn't supposed to happen. I was supposed to press that button, and there were supposed to be all these lasers and special effects, but it didn't. Well, today on Science Max Experiments at Large, we're not gonna be doing one experiment. We're gonna be doing a number of small experiments because we are going to do a light manipulation challenge. I'm gonna get an expert and she's going to challenge me to a game of light manipulation because I am the master of light. Oh, well, at least the green lights are working and Okay, okay, forget it. I'm just gonna turn it, I'm just gonna turn it back to normal. Come on, turn back to it. I'm gonna work on that later. I'm gonna need an expert to help me though. Um, oh, I know, Anne would be really good at this. It really does look kind of weird in here, doesn't it? Oh, well. You okay? Hi. Hi, Phil. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't see what I was doing. Here's your lab coat. Oh. Thank you for coming. Great. Now you're from Let's Talk Science, right? Yes, that's right. All about science education, just like us. Now you're gonna challenge me to a light to manipulation a, game? A light manipulation game. I've been working on a series of challenges since last time we talked. Each awesome. A little more difficult than the last. Well, this is gonna be great, because I am the light manipulation master. Okay, well, we'll see about that. Okay. Challenge number one. Take a seat. Oh, well, that's easy enough. I have written something on the back side of this ball. Okay. And I'm gonna challenge you to read it. Okay, well, I'm ready. I might be able to read it from here. Let's All see. All right. Okay, I see something's written on it, but I can't read what it says. What if you squint? It looks like a couple lines, maybe? I can't quite tell. Any ideas how to solve this challenge, Phil? Um, and I have to be in this chair? Well, you can get out of the chair to set up your solution. But okay. when you read what I've written on the ball, you have to be sitting in the chair. Well, it's light manipulation, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, wait a minute, I've got flashlights in case the power goes out, so maybe I can use a flashlight. Haha, -ha. okay, ready? Pew! Um, huh. Doesn't seem to make it any easier to read. Yeah, I got nothing. Did you give up already? No, of course I don't give up. I told you these were gonna be challenging. This is nothing. I will figure this out. Um, I don't know yet. You're gonna have to get creative. I don't know yet, but I will think of something. Okay. Okay, I will be back. Here, hold the flashlight. Not looking, not looking. I'm gonna go this way. I'm gonna wait right here. Okay. Ah! 
Have you ever wondered why you end up upside down when you look at yourself in a spoon? It's because of light reflection. Light is made of photons. Let's say that these tennis balls bouncing off this wall are photons of light. Now, when the, when the surface is flat, like a mirror, the photons, they bounce in and straight back out again. But when the surface is curved, the photons don't go straight out, they get reflected. So now, this photon is going over there, and if we had photons on this side, they would go... I don't even know where those ones are coming from. Then, okay, so we got, we got photons on this side that are going that way, and photons on that side that are going this way. So the top becomes the bottom, and the bottom becomes the top, and that's why you look upside down when you look at yourself in a spoon. Okay, cut to animation, cut to animation. A lens works by changing the direction of light, too. Lenses are made out of curved pieces of glass. When the photons of light pass through the glass, the curved surface makes their paths change. What was only this big before becomes this big when you see it. Lenses are used in microscopes to see things that are really small, or in telescopes to see things that are very far away. Both times they are making something small appear large. Anne has challenged me to figure out how to see a small object far away, and using a lens is my solution. Check it out, it's a giant magnifying lens, and I'm gonna use it to magnify the ball so that I can see it. Sounds great. All right. I set the lens in front of the ball, which Anne has turned so I can't see what's on it. I add a light. Shine it on the ball so that it's a little bit better illuminated. And then sit in the chair and ask Anne to move it so it's aligned. All right, so bring it to your left. Yeah, keep going, keep going. Keep going, right about there. Try bringing it closer to the ball. Okay, wait, that makes it, that makes it smaller. Try going, bring the lens away from the ball. Ooh, wait. Try a little bit further. Ooh! You're ready for me to spin the ball around? Yep. Okay. It says 71! Nicely done. Easy! Solved! Wait, wait, wait. What? That was just the warm-up. Oh, yeah? Yep. You ready for challenge number two? Challenge yeah. number two! I've got another ball. Okay. With something else written on it. Wait. Are you coming back? Nope. Huh. But I can't even see you from here. Like, like how am I... Huh. You're gonna have to manipulate the light. I have to see around a corner? I have to see around a corner. All right, I'll think of something. So you remember the tennis balls in the wall, right? Right? Okay, so the tennis balls are photons, what light is made out of, and the wall is a mirror. Now right now, the photons are hitting the mirror and bouncing directly back. But what happens if they come in at an angle? Like this. Aha! Those photons are reflecting off the mirror and going that way, which means if I want to see what's emitting those photons, I can see it from here. The same thing happens when you look in a mirror. Oh, okay, mirror. Whoa. The mirror reflects the photons over here. I can see the tennis ball launcher in the mirror, which means if there was a barrier, whoa, between me and the tennis ball launcher, I can still use a mirror and the photons would reflect off the mirror and it comes straight to me, which is how you can use a mirror to see around a corner. In fact, periscopes work the same way. Let's make a periscope right now. See, hey, it's dark in here. Oh, right, because I'm gonna show you my laser. So the light from my laser bounces off this mirror in a straight line. Ha ha, reflection. We can use the power of reflection to make the light go where we want it to. We're gonna, we're gonna build a periscope. Submarines use periscopes because it's hard to see when you're underwater. A submarine will extend a periscope up above the water. The image up here gets transmitted down here. So someone looking through the periscope underwater can see what's going on up on the surface. 
And here's what you need to build it. Two cartons of milk, two small hand mirrors, scissors or a craft knife, a pencil, and science tape, which is the same as regular tape, except you use it for science. And remember, if I go too fast, you can always find these instructions on our website. Step one, cut the tops off your milk cartons. Take your mirror and trace out a rectangle as wide as the mirror, then cut it out. Put some science tape on your mirror and stick it in the carton at an angle. Then put a piece of tape on the inside. Then get the other milk carton and do the same thing. Put a mirror on the inside and then stack the milk cartons together. But don't stack them with the, with the holes on the same side. Make sure you stack them with the holes on opposite sides. And here is what's going on inside. You've got your two mirrors, and one is angled like that, and the other one is angled like this. Light from what you're looking at comes in, hits that first mirror, goes down to that second mirror, and goes to your eye. You can use it to spy on people from below the table. <laughs> or from around corners. So there you go, your very own periscope using light reflection. Did you know that your TV remote can be a flashlight? It's true. If you have the kind of TV remote with a little bulb on the end of it, then when you press the buttons, the bulb lights up. Yeah, I, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, wait a minute. The bulb did not light up, and I've never seen the bulb of my TV remote light up when I press the buttons. Well, that's because your TV remote works on infrared, which is a kind of light you can't see. But you might be able to see it with a camera. If you have a digital camera or a camera on your phone, ah, now you can see, see? It lights up. And because infrared light works the same way as visible light in that it will bounce off a mirror, here's an experiment you can do at home. Bounce the light off your TV remote off a mirror and turn on and off your television. Check this out. You get a mirror, set it up just right, and then aim the remote at the mirror and it turns off the television. Pretty cool, right? But now let's max it out. I've got a complex series of mirrors set up here and I'm gonna bounce the light from the remote all over the room. And here's what that pattern looks like. The light from the remote hits this mirror, which reflects to this mirror, which reflects to this mirror, and then this mirror, and then this mirror, and then finally to the television. Isn't that cool? There you go. Maxed out remote light bouncing infrared flashlight. I gotta come up with a better name, but still, it's pretty cool. Oh, all right. Turn off the television and leave the room. I solved Anne's first light challenge, seeing something far away with a lens. It says 71! But now she's moved the ball around a corner, and now I have the solution. Mirror! A mirror will let me see around the corner. Clever. Right? Okay, so all I gotta do is put the mirror in a position sort of like that, I guess, and then I'm gonna sit in the chair. If you could help me adjust that mirror. Um, uh, keep going that way. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, stop. Nice, okay, go ahead and flip the ball around and I will read the message. It is too small. I can't, okay, I've, I've solved this problem though. Okay, flip it around. The lens, I need the lens. So we'll use a mirror and the lens to, good. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm gonna sit in the chair. Here in the chair. It is backwards. Oh yeah, a mirror inverts the image, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. That's okay, that's okay, I can solve this. All I need, whoa! Other mirror is all I need to solve this problem. So if I take this mirror and I put it here, let's see. Um, there it is. It says 42. Nicely done. <laughs> I am done? ready for anything. What do you got planned for the hardest challenge? Are you sure you're ready for this? Totally. I challenge number three. Challenge number three starts now. What? 
Wait, 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 wait. No, no. This is a light challenge. How am I supposed to do a light challenge if it's dark? Mm, you have to get creative. But it's dark. Well, OK, no problem. I will think of something. I will be back. OK. OK, careful. Wood. I'll be Whoa. waiting. <laughs> careful. So you already know about reflection, right? That's when the beam of light, say from my laser, reflects off this mirror and bounces in a straight line. But check this out. If I don't use the mirror and I shine the laser against the underside of the water, it also reflects just like a mirror. This is called internal reflection. If I uh, have a stream of water and I put my laser beam into the stream, you can see that the laser bounces around inside the stream of water. It's being internally reflected, and the laser isn't going straight anymore. It's following the stream of water down where the water goes. Internal reflection. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, how does this affect me in my everyday life? Internal reflection, who cares? Well, I can tell you why you should care in two words. Fiber optic wires. Three words, fiber optic wires. You see, fiber optics carry information all over the planet. The internet, maybe even your television, travels through fiber optic wires. The good thing is, because of internal reflection, you can bend fiber optic wires any which way or around corners, and the beams of light continue to go straight down inside the wires and get out the other end, making it go where you want it to go. Internal reflection, science. Back to our light challenge. I've seen something small from far away, seen around corners, but now Anne has turned off the lights. But I have a solution. Oh, Anne, oh, Anne, careful. Okay, okay. okay. Sorry, I forgot how dark it was in here. Okay, I figured it out. Okay. Ah, I have a flashlight. No, nope. so all I need no, to no, do no. Is hold on, here. hold on, hold on. What? There's one more rule I didn't tell you. What's the rule? You can't use visible light. How in the world am I going to do this if I can't use visible light? It's a challenge. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, here, hold my flashlight for a second. Ugh. I'm going to make a phone call. Okay. I think I know what to do. I'll be back. Okay. I'll be back. Oh, careful! Ah! Oh. oh, hey, good to see you. Speaking of seeing things, let's talk about the rainbow. All the colors of the spectrum organized in a beautiful pattern. But what are the different colors? I mean, what makes them different? Well, it all has to do with the electromagnetic spectrum. This is visible light. All the colors of the rainbow. And take a look at that little black line that goes up and down there. That's the frequency of the light. Light is a wave. You see the wavelength is a little wider out here on the red side, and it's a little closer together here on the violet side? That's because every color of light has a different length of wave or wavelength. And that is what makes them different when we look at them. But if you think that's all there is to the electromagnetic spectrum, then you're mistaken. So what happens over here on the red side? Does it keep going? Yeah, it does. What? Look, we got infrared here, and then we got microwaves. These are the same kind of waves you use in your oven. And then we got radio waves, which are the same kind of waves you use in your radio. They're all part of the same thing as visible light. Huh? Let's take a look at the other end. Remember these short wavelengths over here beside violet? Well, does that keep going? Yeah. If they keep getting shorter, you get ultraviolet, and then x-rays, and then gamma rays. Huh? Pretty amazing. And look, it's all connected. From radio waves to gamma rays to visible light in between, it's all frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. <laughs> How is this staying up? So everything outside of the visible spectrum is invisible, right? Wrong! Ha <laughs> ha! Bam! Huh? That is an x-ray, a picture we can take using this part of the spectrum. 
we can use special cameras to see outside of the visible spectrum. Huh? Huh? Right? <laughs> yeah. You get you okay, you got it. Huh? And look at these. These are night vision goggles. They help you see in the dark. They use part of the spectrum called infrared. For those of you keeping score, that's this part of the spectrum right here. Pretty neat, right? I would sell you these, but they're already spoken for. Oh, and here he comes now. Hey, Sal. Hey, how you doing? You got those goggles I ordered? Yeah, go ahead, help yourself. Thanks for putting them aside. Can I put them on my tab? Yeah, no problem. All right, thanks, Sal. Okay, see you later. Nice kid. He's always in a rush, though. Phil, is that you? Yeah. Do you need the flashlight? I don't. Turn, turn it off. I can totally make my way over to you. Oh. I can hear you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm right here. Oh, right here. Hi. Because I have night vision goggles. Ooh, ch check it out. Oh, cool. Pretty cool, right? That's awesome. So here's the spectrum again, and here's visible light. My night vision goggles use infrared, this part of the spectrum here with wavelengths just a little bit longer than the red we can see outside of the visible light spectrum. All right, I would say that's allowed. No visible light, and I will see the next ball. Have you got it set up? Uh, I set it up while you were out. Okay, good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit in the chair and, and see if I can see it. Okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, I can totally see everything. Can you tell me what the ball says? It says, it says you win. Nicely <laughs> done. So let's recap. This challenge is the same as the last challenge. The light from the ball was magnified by the lens, sent around a corner by reflecting it off a mirror, and flipped back around by using another mirror. But this time, it's dark. So, using infrared light, thanks to my night vision goggles, I was able to see the ball and win the game. The light manipulation challenge is done. Science Max experiments at large. Time to turn the lights back yep, on. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Huh. What did you do back there? Um, I, I guess we blew a fuse or something. Uh-oh. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and this is Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're gonna be looking at earthquakes! Earthquakes! Huh. Today, we're going to be looking at how to build something. <laughs> That was supposed to happen earlier. Today we're gonna to be looking at how to build something that stands up to the shaking of an earthquake. Mm. Earthquakes happen when two plates on the Earth's surface rub together and it causes the ground to shake. It causes the ground to shake. Sometimes it shakes a little, sometimes it shakes a lot. Chances are you do not live in a place that has earthquakes. But if you do, ask an adult what to do during an earthquake so you can be safe. Modern buildings that are built in earthquake zones are designed to withstand the shaking. But how do scientists and engineers build a building that stands up to the shaking of an earthquake? Well, that's what we're gonna be looking at today. First thing we have to do is simulate an earthquake. We're going to build a shaker table. And here's what you need. Two books and... <sighs> Two books, four elastic bands, and four... four rubber balls. Oh, wait. Uh, okay. Four, four rubber balls. All right, so the first thing you do is actually take your four elastic bands and wrap them around your books. Put one set on one side, one set on the other side, until you have that. Then you take your four balls and you stick them in between the books in the middle-ish area. But you don't want to have them too close to the edges. And now two at the back, and ta-da! You've made your own shaker table. What are you shaking, you ask? I will show you. You build a tower! Like this one here that I built out of building blocks. So here's what you do. You'll need your base to be securely attached to the shaker table. I use painter's tape because it'll come off again without harming the books. And what I want to find out is just how much shaking this tower can take before it falls apart. Ready? Whoa. And there it goes! And when you've done that, 
What you do is you be a science maximite and you design another tower. And you tape it down to your shaker table and see if you can make this tower fall down in an earthquake. And if you built it really well, probably won't. <laughs> but you don't have to just use building blocks. There's all kinds of other materials you can use. Check out this building, which is really tall, and you'll see there's a cup at the top, and that's for a baseball. Hmm. Put it up at the top, and that means there's a weight up there. And then we shake it, and we see what happens. Oh, oh no! Oh! There it goes. So that is what we're going to be doing today on Science Max Experiments at Large. We're gonna be making a giant shaker table and putting a giant structure on top and seeing how we design it to make sure it stands up to the shaking of an earthquake. I'm gonna need an expert to help me though. Um, oh, I know, Anne would be really good at this. Okay, all I need to do is get Anne and we can start. Oh, come on. There it is. All right. Hey, Ann, I, huh, I feel weird. Why do I feel weird? I think you're a chair. Well, that's not good. Oh, hold on a second. Am I, am I good? Okay. Hi, Ann, good to see you. Here's your lab coat. Thank you. So you're from Let's Talk Science, right? I am. All about science education, just like us. Today, I need your help to max out our earthquake table. This is the table this looks part, great. obviously, but this is a tower I've made out of popsicle sticks. Yeah. So in order to max it out, I've already built a large shaker table. Come on. This is my large shaker table. So it's got basketballs underneath as the four balls, but it works exactly the same. Whoa. 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 <laughs> okay, so what kind of tower should we make for the shaker table? If we want something tall, then we'll reinforce it a couple spots. But the true test, it's got to have some sort of weight on top so that it will mimic the weight that would be on a real tower. Right, so maybe I could get a plastic bin and I'll just put some sandbags for weight inside. That would be perfect. And then balls, so that when it falls over, the balls will go everywhere. That would be perfect. OK, great. We shake off. Whoa. I don't know. Okay. I think we should just get off. <laughs> Another thing that happens during an earthquake is soil liquefaction. Liquefaction means something turns to liquid. In this case, the very ground you might be standing on. Here's how you can experiment with soil liquefaction. All you need is a plastic container and some water, not very much. Barely enough to cover the bottom of the container because what you're gonna put in next is sand. And you wanna put it in there and spread it around. Just add enough sand so it just starts to turn dry on the very last layer. So here is a house that I'm going to put on top. And now I will simulate an earthquake. The water rises up and it sort of turns to liquid, soil liquefaction. And heavy things like houses and cars, they tend to sink like that. And then the soil rehardens and everybody's houses are stuck in the mud. Now, let's max it out. This is a giant tub of sand and water, and this is a vibrating platform that will simulate an earthquake. Now, as you can see, this sand is totally solid. I can jump all around on this sand, no problem. But when I turn on the vibrating table and simulate an earthquake, things will change. The vibrations bring the water below the sand to the surface and cause the sand particles to separate. What was solid now turns to liquid in my simulated earthquake, and I start to sink. I'm up to my shins! And there you go, soil liquefaction! Hey, look at that. It's totally solid. <laughs> <laughs> so I all look back in. I'm totally, uh-oh. You know what I realized? When it stops vibrating, it really becomes solid again. And it's very tough to. <sighs> well, there, there you go. Soil liquefaction. I'm, uh, I'm really kind of stuck in here. I. 
So Anne and I have made a large shaker table. Now it's just a matter of designing a building. We use lumber and cut it up, use screws to attach it all together, put a platform on top for our weight, and attach it securely to our shaker table. The building is super simple. Just four corners and a few planks around the outside. No structure in the middle. And finally, the big heavy weight on the top. There. We attach a pole to the shaker table so we can shake from a safe distance and try it out. Okay, very slow. Forward. Let's see how much shaking it can stand with our shakeometer. Okay. Uh, that seems to be okay. Kidding. Oh, oh no. Oh no! We barely start to shake our tower before it collapses. Oh, that didn't really last very long, did it? It completely folded up on itself. Uh, what do we do to fix this, make it better? I think the easiest thing we can do is to use thicker wood. It'll make it less wobbly. Okay, sure, let's make another one. Bye, okay. folks. We do have lots of wood, that's a good thing. Anne and I are trying small improvements every time. There. Our last building used thinner pieces of wood. Now we're using thicker wood, which we think will help keep the weight at the top from collapsing the building. Everything else about the design of our building is the same. We put the weight on top and fix our pole and we're good to go. All right, you ready? Problem. Okay. Turn the creek. But it recovers. You can yeah. see it lean and then it comes back and it, re and it resets. Definitely doing better than the last one. Oh no. I'm impressed. Oh, 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 here oh, we go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it definitely did better than the first one. It did better than the first one. And the thicker wood definitely helped. But it was really starting to turn. I think on the next one, we need some platforms in the center to help strengthen it even more. Earthquake building 3.0. Thicker wood this time, but with platforms in the middle. So we're gonna see how well this version works with these middle parts that'll hopefully reinforce. And they're just like the floors of a building. Okay, well, let's find out if it's gonna make any difference. It's gonna wobble a little, but it looks pretty good. As soon as we start shaking, it's really obvious this building is more solid. Uh-oh, it's starting to creak. Oh, it's really starting to creak. The platforms in the middle really seem to improve the structure. You can see it bend all the way over and still recover. But still, it wasn't long before... It's really starting to lean. <laughs> The extra pieces really kind of made it more impressive. It definitely lasted a lot longer than the other two. It did, but here's what I'm wondering. Are we going in the wrong direction? What do you mean? Well, because if it's really solid, it resists the change. Okay, I see where you're going with this. So if we make it flexible, it can resist the shaking of an earthquake. I think it's worth a shot. Yeah, okay, let's do it. Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker. My tuna fish and meatball sub soup is coming along quite nicely. But what will we have for dessert? I know. How about earthquake buildings? Ha <laughs> ha! It's a building made out of wafer cookies. But the people on Vanilla Street built in the gelatin neighborhood. And the people on Chocolate Street built in the crispy rice part of town. Exciting. Now, here comes the earthquake. Oh, no! Oh, it's shaking! Oh! The shaking has come and gone for the people on Chocolate Avenue, and their building is still standing. Now, let's take a look over here on Vanilla Street, and here comes an earthquake. Oh, no! Oh dear, looks like the people on Vanilla Street are going to have to rebuild their building because it's all fallen over and being eaten. Mmm, <laughs> delicious. Buildings can be built the same way, but the kind of soil they sit on make a large difference if there's an earthquake. Shaky, wiggly soil or solid, non-moving soil. So there you go, an experiment you can try at home. Delicious. Well, I'm Buster Beaker, and thank you for joining me on this episode of Cooking with Science. Mm, now to try my soup. Seismometer in 60 seconds. Learning how to predict and measure earthquakes is an important branch of science. The Earth is shaking, but which way did the earthquake come from? It's all about measuring the vibrations, and to do that, you need 
a seismometer. All you need is a ball, some paper cups, some modeling clay, a pencil, and science tape, which is the same thing as invisible tape, except I use this tape for science. First, take your pencil and stick it straight down into the modeling clay. Then, you take your cups and you arrange them in a circle and tape the cups down. And that goes right in the middle, just like that. Now, what you do is you take the ball and you carefully balance it on the pencil. Now you have created a seismometer. It will tell you what direction an earthquake came from. Watch, I will be the earthquake. Ready? Do you see that? The ball fell into the cup facing the direction that I hit the table. And now I'm gonna hit the table from over here. Yep, it fell in the direction that I hit the table. Okay, let's try from over here. There you go, your very own seismometer that you can use to measure earthquakes that you create on the table. Back to our earthquake building. Anne and I tried a few different designs and they each got a little better. But now we're wondering what would happen if we built the tower out of very flexible material. We used some plastic tubing and attached the wood with bungee cords, which are like big elastics. Wow, okay, so looks good. So let's test it. Okay. And sure enough, when we start shaking it, the tower holds up to as much shaking as we can give it. Wait. What? Aren't we missing something? Oh. Yeah, we're missing the weight at the top. Of course. So I think we need to try it again. So we add the weight to the top, and then everything changes. Oh, oh no. Look at it twist. Oh, dear. It's twisted. A flexible tower is great until you try to put a weight at the top. And then it just seems <laughs> really unstable. Oh, there it goes. Oh. <laughs> Look at that. It's totally bent. It didn't break at all. It just fell over. Yeah, it couldn't even support the weight. So it was almost too flexible. So I guess we should go back to a more rigid design. Mm -hmm. But what if we change the shape a little bit? Because mm -hmm. you know what I was thinking. This is a very stable shape. Mm -hmm. Triangle, because triangles are really strong. What about um, we, we make an X? Like a triangle within a triangle. Triangle, and then triangle. So that really reinforces all of the shaking, like all the motion. We'll never know until we try. All right. Uh-oh. I have all my friends coming over, and I don't have a table. But that's okay. I will make a table using my friends. This is an awesome experiment you can do with four friends. Come on in, science friends. I've got Sam and Dylan and Polly here to help me. So everybody turn to your left and sit sideways on the chair and then scooch the chairs into the middle. And then everybody leans back onto the knees of the other person. And then, this is why I said you need four friends, because you need the fifth person to remove the chairs! Whoa. The reason why this works is because everybody's weight is being supported on the legs of the person next to them. Okay, we're gonna rotate in a circle, everybody. Okay, ready? Here we go, rotating, R rotating. Oh, oh, science table. Ooh. Hey, we're pretty good at this. Okay. Uh oh. Oh no, oh no! <laughs> so there you go. Awesome way to make a table using your friends. Well done. Well done. Science. Here's an experiment you can do to impress the adults in your house. You need three glasses, all of equal height, and three knives, not sharp knives, the dull knives you use, maybe the ones you use at dinner time. Take your three knives and put them in a triangle, all equally spaced out. Then move the knives together to make a little triangle, right like that. Then what you wanna do is you wanna carefully arrange the knives so each knife is going above one knife and below another knife. So there we go. Then you wanna take this careful pattern that you created and you wanna put it on top of your three glasses. One, where each handle of the knives are gonna be. And if you place it carefully, and you've done the over-unders correctly, it will stay up. Pretty amazing, the knives support their own weight. But they don't just support their own weight, they can support a lot more weight too. Pretty amazing, right?
This is a great experiment. It's also something really interesting that we can max out. Come on. And here you go, the maxed out knife balance. I've got three pieces of lumber and three barrels, and as you can see, the pattern is exactly the same. Under, over, under, over, under, over. Ha ha. So, the question is, how much faith do I have in science? Ah, it totally supports my weight. I know it's going to work because I know that a two by four, which is the kind of lumber I'm using, can hold up my weight. So that means the structure can support me. <laughs> Science! You know what the cool thing is? The cool thing is that even though it's holding me up, each one of these pieces of wood is only up because it's supported by the others. You pull one out and it all falls apart. Ann and I have tried solid towers and flexible towers, and nothing has worked fantastically yet with a big weight on the top. Having a big weight on the top of our tower means we need something that will resist the movement of that weight. So now we're going to start with a triangle. Unlike a rectangle, triangles are very stable. A wider base keeps the structure from swaying too much, and cross braces in the middle mean that there are other triangles within our triangle, all the better to resist movement. Thank you. After Ann and I built our tower, we added the weight to the top, secured it to the base, and tried it out. Okay, here we go. Ooh. It's looking good. No problem. It's not twisting. It's, it's not, not even, leaning. Not even creaking. No, it looks really good. Wow, this one is really solid. As you can see, this tower is way more solid than our square tower or the flexible tower. Okay, look at that. Like, if that's not an earthquake, I don't know what is. Look at that. Look at the way the ground is moving. I don't know if we can shake it much more than this. Faster. Our triangular tower is up past a level of shaking that made the other towers collapse. Now it's time to max out the shaking. There's only one level of shaking that we can do above this. What's that? We shake from either side. We give it all we have. The floor was bouncing from side to side, the tower was tilting and was totally solid. It's still holding strong. In fact, Anne and I wore out before the building showed any signs of falling over. I think we've done it. Woo! Nice yeah. job. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Science Max experiments at large earthquake proof building. I mean, come on. That was impressive. I like it. Greetings, Science Maximites. Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. Wow, I really need some more energy. Fortunately, I have some saved up. Ah, that's better. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Storing energy like that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but you can store energy, and that's what this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large is all about. In fact, I'm gonna store some energy in this container simply by putting it up here on the top shelf. More on that later. But right now, let's look at another way that you can store energy and release it in a really fun way. We're gonna make a spool racer, and it's pretty simple. Here's all you need. You need some science ribbon. Now, if you don't have science ribbon, you can use regular ribbon, but the ribbon really isn't important. It's the spool that's important. You'll also need a washer, elastics, pencil or pencil crayon, popsicle or craft stick, and science tape. Science tape is the same as invisible tape, except I use this one only for science. Here's how you build it. Break the popsicle stick so it's smaller than the diameter of the spool. Then put the elastics on top of the pencil and pull them tight, thread the popsicle stick through, and feed it all through the hole of the spool. Grab the elastics on the other side and pull out the pencil and everything will be threaded perfectly. Then stick on the washer and thread the pencil through. Finally, tape the popsicle stick down so it doesn't move. And if any of these steps are a little too fast, don't worry. All of the instructions are up on the website. That was cool. I, oh, I, can't, I can't make it go away. I can only make it come up. So there you go, a spool racer. And here's how it works. You spin the pencil around, and that twists the elastic. Now, that elastic is going to want to unwind, right? 
So just keep spinning that pencil around until it's good and tight. And then when you put it on the ground, the pencil's gonna wanna unwind, but it can't because the table's in the way now, which means that the energy is gonna transfer to the spool, which is gonna turn, whoa, and it's gonna drive away. Yeah, let's try it out for real. So why does this work? It works because the elastic is coiled, right? Yes, and because I'm putting in the energy to twist it. You see, I'm putting in effort to spin this pencil crayon around, and then when I've finished, all of my effort has been stored in the elastic. When I let it go, my energy transfers into movement. So that's, uh-oh. <laughs> That's what we're gonna do today, Science Maximites. We're gonna max out the spool racer. I think Anthony would really know how to help me with this. So, I'm off to the Ontario Science Center. Come on. Phil! Phil! What happened, Phil? What happened? Are you okay? Anthony. Yeah, hi. Oh, were you, in, were you in the middle of something? I don't worry about it, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. You know what I was wondering? If I could get your, your help with something. Sure, yeah. Yeah, one word, spool racer. Actually, actually, that's two words, spool, yeah. spool yeah. racer. Okay. Yeah, so you want to help me max out a giant spool racer? Uh, yeah. Awesome, let's go back to Science Matt's headquarters. Okay, Anthony, today I want to max out the spool racer. Awesome. Right, so you twist up the elastic and it goes from potential energy, all stored, to kinetic. Kinetic energy, Whoa. there we go. That's awesome. So, okay. not too hard to design. Should be fairly easy to yeah, max Yeah, really out. simple couple of parts here. We just got elastic band inside. Yep. And then this big long pencil to store the energy and then release it. And so. the most important part. Ah. Is spool. Is the spool. Exactly. And I know where we should start. Where's that? Right here. This is an industrial uh -huh. cable spool. So the big, thick electrical cables, they come wound on this thing. Yeah, okay. So, that figure. We Whoa. start with this. Got right? it. And the good news is that it's got a hole already. And, check it out, it rolls, it rolls really well, right? Uh-huh. Okay, cool. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. So, uh, guess... bungee cord? Yep. And long pole or something? Yeah. And uh, we're ready to go. I guess let's get some parts. Okay. Okay. Oh, hey, how you doing? You, you wanna buy something? I got a lot of stuff here, and I got a special today only. Potential energy, huh? I will throw in some potential energy with any order. You see this stuff on the shelves here? The stuff on the higher shelves has more potential energy than the stuff on the lower shelves. Don't believe me here, hold on, hold on. Look at this state-of-the-art traffic controller. Right now, it's sitting up here on this high shelf. Now, if it were to fall, it would be going fast, which means it would have a lot of kinetic energy. <laughs> you see, when it fell down, it had enough kinetic energy to completely break itself apart. Um, yeah. Well, that's the difference between potential energy and kinetic energy. Look at this bagel, just sitting here, not moving, minding its own business on top of this ramp. It's all potential energy and no kinetic energy. And when it gets to the floor, it's all kinetic energy and no potential energy. <laughs> and now it has neither because it's on the floor and it's not moving. <laughs> Five second rule. And now you know your energy. So what do you say? You want this thing? Uh, tell you what, I'll, I'll give you a discount because, because you know it's it's gently used. Hey, I'll even throw in this bagel, huh? Also gently used. Anthony and I are maxing out the spool racer. We start with a long coil of bungee cord, which is kind of like a giant elastic, and feed it through the spool. Then we put on a big piece of plastic to act as our washer and use a long pole as the pencil. We flip the spool on its side to wind it up. Then we flip it back and it's ready to go. All right, so we have it all wound up and we're ready to try it again, but with one change. 
Uh, Phil. Yeah. What's with the trike? I ride the trike. It's like I always say, what's the point of building something big if I can't ride it? There's no way you're gonna fit on this thing. No, no, I don't, I don't put my feet on the pedals. I put my feet here on the back, right? And okay, then, yeah, I get it, I get it. You got it? Uh, hold, hold on, I gotta do my helmet up. Safety first. You ready? I'm on it. Okay, three, two, one, go. Oh, it's working. It's working. <laughs> Amazing. All the stored energy in the bungee cord is being released and the spool starts to turn. There's even enough energy that I can get pulled along behind it. It's not going that fast, no, though. And it's, it's pretty good, though. It still pulls me. Right? Yeah, pretty good. So, spool racer actually able to get pulled by it. Yeah. You know what? I think we can go even bigger. Bigger? Yes. Well, what did you have in mind? I'm glad you asked. What is this? What this you... is an industrial cable spool, and this is the biggest size that they make. <laughs> and I thought we would do the same thing with this. What do you think? I think this could generate a huge amount of energy. Okay, so all we gotta do is just build it just like we built that other one. Just bigger. Except way bigger. Let's do it. <laughs> when you set a domino on its end, you're giving it potential energy because it can fall. Ooh, and when you put two dominoes together, you can start a chain reaction, because that one will fall into that one. Ah, but it's a lot more fun with more dominoes. Setting up a run of dominoes is a lot of fun, but it takes a flat surface and a steady hand. And if you want to do it yourself, add gaps, so if one part falls, it doesn't take out the whole run. Last one. There. I had some dominoes left, but I did it. I made the Science Max logo. See? Science right? Max. Sort of. Let's see how it works. Ready? Yeah! <laughs> now it's time to max it out. Giant maxed out dominoes! Even though these dominoes are giant, they're still gonna work the same. They're standing up on their ends, which means they've got some potential energy. And when I give this one a push, that potential is gonna turn into kinetic energy and it's gonna knock the next one and the next one and the next one. I, I hope, we, I don't know what's gonna happen, but let's find out, you ready? Okay, three, two, one. The problem is, when you use dominoes this big, setting them up again is a real chore. <sighs> this is a mouse trap. But don't worry, no mice are gonna be harmed in the making of this episode. Mouse traps are a great example of stored energy. You see, in order to set a mouse trap, you have to push this bar back, and it's hard to do because the spring holds it. And then you set the mouse trap by putting this little lever underneath this very sensitive trigger. And once you have it set, all that energy is stored as potential energy but it'll go off with just the slightest touch, releasing the energy. So what if I had a number of mouse traps and they're all set and all of that potential energy is stored up and I dropped a number of ping pong balls on them? Well, then I could set off a chain reaction where one mouse trap flies and hits another mouse trap that hits a ping pong ball and then they all go. Now this is something you can try at home, but do not set the mouse traps yourself. It can really hurt if it snaps on your fingers, so you should probably ask an adult to help you, and then you can see how brave the adults in your house are. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Mouse trap, chain reaction! And last one, there we go. And now, let's max this out. Let's do it with 90 mouse traps. And this is a crate of ping pong balls. So, let's see what happens when we put them together. Ha <laughs> ha! 
There you go. Maxed out ping pong ball mouse trap chain reaction. <sighs> awesome. Ready? I'm on it. Anthony and I have built a large okay, spool racer. Oh, it's working. It's working. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked so well, the only option was to go bigger. What is this? this what is, is an industrial cable spool, and this is the biggest size that they make. I think this could generate a huge amount of energy. Huge... Building our giant spool racer is the same process as the other builds. So the steps are exactly the same, but on a larger scale. And this time, we're going to use, obviously, the large spool, and we're going to use this 2 by 4 as our pencil wind thing. Coil some bungee cord, feed it through. Ready? Yep. Okay. Here it comes. Ah, there we go. Got it? Ha <laughs> ha, yeah. Add a washer and a long 2x4 to act as our pencil. And now we stick the giant 2x4 inside the coil. Just about. Yeah, we got it. There okay, we cool. go. And we're ready to try it out. So it looks like we're ready to go. Yeah, exactly. Uh, do you want to do it in here or you want to do it outside? Oh, definitely outside. Okay, let's go. Yeah, okay, cool. Yep. Oh, it's heavy. Right. Batteries are great at storing energy. They store electricity. Batteries. But if you're like me and you have a whole bunch of batteries and you don't remember which are the good ones and which are the dead ones, there's a trick that you can use to find out. Get a frying pan or a brick or a concrete floor or something else that's very, very hard and an adult's permission. Here's the secret. Dead batteries will bounce and batteries that still have some life in them won't. Watch. Good battery. Dead battery. Now, it's a little hard to see, but listen. One hit, two hits. Here's what's going on. See, batteries store electricity in the form of a gel, sort of like modeling clay. This is modeling clay, fresh from the fields, where the pit, the pits, the mine, wherever modeling clay comes from. And this is modeling clay I've left out for about five days, so it's all dried up and hard. Now, when modeling clay is new, it's all wet and soft. And when you drop it, it doesn't bounce very well. I've left this piece of modeling clay out to dry for about five days. Now it's all dried up and old and it bounces. New, old. So, same thing with the battery. Good batteries won't bounce, and bad batteries will. Science. Here's a fun chain reaction you can do with popsicle sticks, or craft sticks, because these ones are a little bit wider than popsicle sticks. It is because these kind of sticks are slightly bendy, and when you bend them and put them together in a pattern in a certain way, you can keep them under tension, and then they want to snap back, and then they'll fly. So here's how you make the pattern. Ready? You take a popsicle stick or a craft stick, and you put it down on the table. I know, OK, it's a slow start. And we take another one and put it across. Now comes the secret. The secret is over and then under. You want to put it over one and then under another, like that, and then this one, over, under. Put it over the one that looks like it's the top stick and under the stick that looks like it's the bottom stick. And then it starts to hold tension. It starts to hold the potential energy. Continue this pattern. Each stick goes over and under the two sticks at the end. Now here's the trick. Soon as this one lets go, then that one will let go, then that one, then that one, then that one, and that's how you get the chain reaction. They all start flying up. So you have to build it with never letting go of that last stick. You've got to always remember to keep a hand on it, or else you'll have to start again. So, OK, so you ready? You want to see me let it go? Here we go. I know, that isn't so great, because it's better if it's a longer chain. So fortunately, I have a longer chain. I've got a binder clip on this end, keeping the craft sticks together. Ready? Three. Two, one. Wow! Release of kinetic energy from the potential energy of winding all the craft sticks together. Fun, and you can totally do it at home. Now, let's max it out. Behold, 
almost 800 craft sticks in a long, nicely designed triangle. Ready? Two, one. I'm gonna go get something to clean this all up with. All right. So Anthony and I have built a giant spool racer and have taken it outside to try it out. In order to wind it up, we flipped over the last version on its side. But this spool weighs 200 kilograms. Easy to roll, almost impossible to flip over. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, get it! I don't think it's gonna work. It's too heavy to move. Yeah. We should have thought of that before. Well, I'm sure we'll think of something. Uh... So Anthony and I thought about it. <laughs> and thought about it. <sighs> and thought about it. I got it! What? No. No. But you. And the answer finally dawned. What if we roll it this way? Because then that would wind it up, right? That's brilliant! By rolling it backwards, we wind up the bungee cord in one direction, which will make it want to unwind in the other direction. Anthony and I roll it across the parking lot to get it wound up tight. I don't think I'm going to hold it anymore. OK. OK. Let go. Uh, okay, okay, it's wedged. It worked. Uh, all right, one more thing. We're gonna hook the trike up to this one as well. Okay. Okay. So right now, it's all wound up, and when it gets moving, that potential energy in the coil will turn into kinetic. Exactly. Kinetic energy. Now, just in case you're tempted to try this at home, I need to tell you, do not try this at home. We're trained professionals, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Well, as much as anybody can be trained for this, because no one uh, really does this. Are you ready? Ready! OK, here we go. Oh. <laughs> it's working! It's working! Yeah! Sure enough, all the potential energy we stored in the bungee cords starts to unwind, which rolls the spool and pulls me along behind it. What's more, that big, heavy spool has a lot of momentum. Yeah. So when it gets going fast, it just wants to keep moving. It wasn't long before I had to jump off. Uh -oh. Oh. 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 That was amazing! All right, that had a lot of kinetic energy. That was a ton of kinetic energy. There you go, Science Max, experiments at large, massive spool racer. Your turn next? Yeah! Okay. 